and I'm very happy that Professor Jörg Feldmann from the University of, of Graz is here. And uh, we are very much looking forward to your talk, um, PFAS, Emerging Contaminants. So we're going to continue with the results on environmental analyses and very interesting insights. Jörg, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carsten, for the kind, uh, kind words. Uh, thank you, Kerstin, for the invitation. And uh, congratulations, first of all, to David. Yeah, fantastic, great. Uh, this, is, this is really also an, an inspiring moment for me. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I've only half an hour, I guess. Um, so PFAS, uh, emerging contaminants. Uh, can atomic spectrometry help there for the analysis? Well, what I would like to cover is, as, first of all, uh, what are PFAS and which methods are actually used for uh, um, biological and environmental samples and can ICPMS help or other techniques? Well, if you don't know what PFAS is, but uh, be sh you can be sure that you have PFAS in your body. Aren't you happy about it? So uh, they are always in the news, and their PFAS are pair and polyfluorinated alkylated substances. Um, and uh, usually there's only, only a few, you can see here, uh, are listed in the Stockholm Convention of Persistent Organic Pollutants. This is uh, uh, PFOS and related compounds, so C8 uh, compounds, so octanulic uh, sulfonate, and also the, the acid, the um, um, octanulic uh, acid. And they are, they are listed there. And why are they listed? They are, first of all, persistent, because the CF bond can't be cleaved by, by bacteria very easily. Um, and uh, they are um, um, also interfering with our uh, biochemistry in all sorts of different ways. And that's why they are uh, listed in there. Uh, when you look at uh, how important they are academically, well, I have made my career on arsenic, so I have to compare this on arsenic speciation. These are papers and citations uh, over the years. So a rapid increase, 500 papers per year on, on when you put it in in Web of Science. And if you put only PFOA or PFOS in there, then you have already 400 papers per year, and it uh, increases rapidly. Um, that there are only, only two members of the PFAS group. What are the classification of PFAS? You can subdivide them, first of all, in polymers. We know this all, so uh, Teflon and, uh, and PFA and all, all of this. And then we have uh, non-polymeric uh, compounds, and they can be subdivided into polyfluorinated, so not every hydrogen is uh, substituted by a fluorine, and perfluorinated compounds. And there are different classes of it, and two classes we have already talked about, so, uh, or I introduced them to you. So these are the carboxylic acids. So uh, you can have maybe different strain lengths. Uh, only the C8 is now banned, but, but there are, um, could be others. So it could be 20 of them. The sulfonates, also maybe 20. And then you sulfonamides. And if you, if you think that's all what's, what, is, uh, what is used by the industry, no, there are much more, and I'm not asking any questions what's, what's, what the structures are here. But you see how many, how many different types of uh, PFAS compounds exist, and this is an analytical task which we can't win. There are more than 4,700 compounds registered, and, uh, and other <coughs> of these compounds uh, um, can be also uh, then further metabolized to other compounds which are not listed here. Well, what is the state of the art analytical methodology? Um, the state of the art is using UPLC electrospray triple co uh, triple quad mass spectrometry, so target analysis. So, uh, and in target analysis you need standards. Usually you have isotopically labeled standards. And here, Victoria Müller in, uh, in, a, in a lab in Graz um, uh, developed this these, uh, uh, method or introduced this uh, to Graz. And so you have maybe 30 odd compounds you can do from 4,700. Yeah, so this is, this is quite all right already. Um, target analysis, and I would like to illustrate on a couple of um, uh, case studies. Um, that we are not seeing everything. We are seeing only a tiny bit of it, ne? so uh, uh, of PFAS. The one study is concerned about uh, 
uh, stranded whales. This is uh, a study back in Scotland. Um, and there are the whales, maybe if you have heard a talk from me before, we talked about uh, arsenic accumulation, bioaccumulation, or mercury and selenium bioaccumulation in these whales. And this is actually the same uh, uh, set of samples. These are 20 odd uh, stranded uh, pilot whales, the stranded south of Aberdeen in Scotland. Uh, we don't know why, and that's why we're doing also all this research. And the interesting bit is there, there are from all age groups, from one year, so newborn to 32 years old. And we extracted all the compounds, and this is actually also uh, led uh, before by Eva Krupp, and uh, she gave uh, her last talk here four years ago. And, uh, and here, uh, this, and we continue this work with a, the with a PFAS in collaboration with Leo Young in Örebro University in Sweden. We wanted to look uh, at, uh, oh sorry, I, I forgot to mention Amna, and this is uh, the PhD work from Amna Alsbedi, still in Aberdeen, uh, one of my PhD students in there. So she took then all these tissues, analyzed them for PFAS with these target analysis. She had 35 of these compounds, then they're isotopically labeled, and you can quantify them. Um, then you don't have some matrix effects with the electrospray. And here only a few data. Here you can see then the, the, the age from one year to 29 year old for the liver samples. And these are only one class of the compounds. These are the polyfluorinated carboxylic acids. Uh, what is striking is that the C8, which is forbidden, is not there. But other compounds, uh, so the, uh, the C9 and C11 are there. And is that a result of a ban? So that's a, maybe industry shifts from the C8 to other components when they generate polymers or other compounds? We don't know. Or is it degradation or metabolism from other polymers? We don't know. Uh, if you look, and I'm not asking a question, if you look at uh, kidney and, uh, and muscles, you see a similar pattern, but uh, um, in general, oh, uh, uh, you see no bio uh, bioaccumulation, which is, uh, which is uh, interesting. But this is, uh, this is something I would like here uh, to go a little bit more in detail. Also in brain, these compounds travel through the blood-brain barrier. And here we see longer chain uh, compounds from the PFAS, and that is understandable, longer chain, more lipophilic, uh, past the blood-brain barrier. What is, however, striking, we, what we would expect is with age, you would have an increase in concentration, so a bioaccumulation. That's why these set of, uh, of samples are interesting. That is what we see with uh, 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 other uh, um, pollutants. No? A persistent organic pollutants, but not with, with PFAS. And in fact, when you sum them up, the younger ones have higher concentration in nanogram per gram than the older ones, which is, we don't understand. Maybe we see only a little picture, yeah, so of the whole thing. Uh, or it is, is it some kind of a degradation, yeah? so uh, of, of the known compounds to something we are not targeting. What we need is really a mass balance and an extractable organofluorin, uh, um, a total mass balance. So what is really and in, in the form of organofluorin in the samples? And so for that, we need a, a fluorine-specific detection. And we have heard already a little bit about this in the morning. And we used also different techniques. For example, we used microwave-induced plasma. Um, and uh, you, could, uh, you could measure then uh, a fluorine as, uh, as calcium fluoride. Um, and, uh, but the detection limits were not good, it was only the PPM level. Then we used high resolution continuum source graphite furnace molecular absorption spectrometry. What a mouthful. And, uh, and we tested this out if it can be used really for PFAS. But what we found is the ionic ones, the non volatile ones, they work very well. But if some of the PFAS compounds are neutral, then they are volatilizing a graphite tube before they atomize if you have zircon in there or not. Yeah, so therefore, it's not ideal, although the detection limits are quite good. So state-of-the-art uh, technique is, uh, is really uh, um, combustion ion chromatography, which is now introduced in Graz to um, our student Eleanor uh, Matic. 
uh, she used then the method um, um, yeah, illustrated here. You put uh, your sample, could be a solid or a liquid sample, you combust this with uh, oxygen and with water to HF and then automatically it's absorbed and then online it is measured in eye chromatography. Um, this is a method uh, of choice really. <coughs> We see only uh, huge uh, um, uh, problems with reproducibility in the detect uh, in the area where we would like to get in into the sub PPB range, and here we have we have detection limits also only around 20 microgram per liter. But hey, this is a uh, this is the best methods available. Let's use it, and we use this then uh, also for the whale samples. And when you see here the whale samples, here the liver. Uh, numbers, the blue one was the sum of the PFAS, so this is not bioaccumulating, but the total fluorine in the extracted organic fluorine fraction is also not bioaccumulating. We should see an increase there. So we are completely puzzled. Yeah, But maybe there's something in there um, which, um, uh, which uh, 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 some transported which excretes, excretes these excretes these uh, compounds. What we see also is and it's very clear here in blubber, for example, we, uh, the, the total detected uh, identified PFAS, there's only a very small fraction and in kidney it's maybe 50%, but it, overall most of the um, uh, organofluorine compounds in the whales uh, from the North Sea are basically undetected. And in fact, the detected ones uh, um, decrease with age, exactly what we see uh, uh, when we, s we looked at the, um, at the sum of the PFAS in the brain, decrease. So what we think is basically, if you have, for example, a carboxylic acid here, then you get maybe undetectable uh, PFAS compounds. And therefore what we need is really uh, a targeted, uh, um, a non-targeted uh, elect. Um, non-targeted technique where we see all the organofluorine compounds. Well, I'm, as you know, most of you know that uh, I moved from, from Scotland to Austria and well, Austria is landlocked, there's not much whale stranding going on. So uh, therefore I thought I, I'd do something else, what the, what the Austrians are known for. And even in COVID time, you can go skiing. So therefore, we, we had good sampling opportunities. But we, in, in seriously, uh, we wanted to look at really what is the a, is a real background uh, of uh, PFAS in soil. We had a lot of measurements from Scotland, but here just some uh, um, data from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Austria, from Styria, Lachtal. So we sampled there a transect uh, somewhere in, in an alpine soil and uh, Victoria's work here and uh, she, f she could identify in all soil samples nanograms, uh, nanograms per gram uh, a PFAS in every soil. It's in a remote co location. Where does that come from? Well, yeah, from skiing uh, possibly because they do, especially COVID time, touring skis, they go over this and what do you do with skis in, in, a, in the autumn? You put ski wax on. Yeah, and then and so we could actually then uh, do a very, um, uh, yeah, we worked on the weekend to do some sampling, as you can imagine, uh, also during COVID time. Uh, I don't want to show you then the data now from the, uh, from the snow, but uh, from the sources of it, and these are waxes. So these waxes you can buy, and, uh, and you have something, uh, some of them have non-floral wax on it, and some are fluorinated. Uh, waxes and you know this immediately because fluorinated waxes are more expensive. Here the good news is when we did then the analysis on it, so using the HPLC electrospray QTOF MS, so a non-targeted analysis with electrospray, we don't find any species in the non-fluorovax. Great. But in the fluorovax we didn't find anything either in some of them. And the other thing is we have here brand specific different type of, of, uh, of compounds which we identify. A whole different, you, you see only the abbreviation, I don't want to go into detail, yeah, so. But brand specific, different type of things. And some of them don't have anything. I wonder why I paid so much money for it, if there's no fluorine there. 
However, when you do then a mass balance and do EUF, these compounds have also high EUF. Before, we had here the, the uh, identified um, compounds make up up to maximum one PP, uh, ppm. And here we see also one percent. One percent of the VAX here in some of the cases uh, um, are, well, any type of organofluorine compounds. So what we see when we do the normal analysis, we don't see anything. Yeah, this is, this is very, very small traces. And what we really need here is some other uh, element-specific detection. And uh, so just to, to summarize this part here, then say, well, if you use uh, HPLC, electrospray mass spectrometry, uh, well, we don't see any target analysis, we don't see any uh, PFAS when we don't have standards, we don't see novel PFAS, we don't see, for example, non-PFAS, fluorinated compounds which are aromate, uh, aromatic, for example, pesticides and drugs. They are, uh, nowadays, there are lots of them are generated, they would be also extractable. Um, what you can do is suspect screening for these things. And you can do non-targeted analysis using accurate mass, like an Orbitrap or QTOF. And what you, however, need, you generate a lot of data, and you have to fish out what the uh, fluorinated compound is. You need a fluorid-specific detector. The other problem is neutral PFAS, they are not ionized in, in electrospray. So you need another uh, source, really, that you, that you get a, a high sensitivity. So you need really something which is more powerful. And, uh, and yeah, polymers, and they are not tackled at all. Né? So, and, and this is what you could do when you co uh, combine uh, flow, field, flow fractionation, by, uh, for example, and, and uh, mouth detection with fluorine specific detector. So, what we saw a few years back, and some people maybe know the papers, uh, this is the work, a PhD work of Lali Jabari. He thought, uh, well, let's, let's use ICPMS. We have uh, enough of these instruments in the lab. Let's sacrifice one of them. And, uh, and, but you, you know from the first lecture of analytical chemistry, you can't do, you cannot do, uh, analyze almost every element, but not fluorine. Yeah, so because of the high ionization, um, um, uh, the ionization potential. And, uh, but why not looking at interferences, so clusters, and uh, especially looking at uh, metal fluorine clusters, uh, which, uh, uh, or ions which have a high dissociation energy and with the fluorine, the metal clusters, and very low with the oxygen. And uh, there are a few candidates on the list. This is barium, europium, and deuterium. Hey, back to the deuterium. Um, and, uh, and then we thought, okay, uh, let's measure on 157. You had 157 new interference. If you have a lot of barium in there and fluoride, you maybe get that as well. Um, and that is what we what we thought might might form in a plasma when you mix basically your uh, sample fluorine sample with a barium solution, for example, mix it in there. This cluster is formed in a plasma, and then we can detect it either with barium plus uh, reacting with atomic uh, fluorine or barium two plus with F minus. So we did this and used. Um, um, uh, the 8,800 Agilent uh, triple quad uh, ICPMS, and we wanted to uh, do uh, well a calibration. Uh, the, the background was so high, and th that means we have a lot of interferences in there. Well, probably it was not the gadolinium because we didn't use uh, water from Bielefeld. Yeah. Uh, that's probably um, probably some other other sources, and uh, it's, it's probably then barium uh, oxyhydroxides. And when we use then different cell gases there, then we can reduce, uh, could reduce basically the, the background to lower levels and we could get a uh, calibration. Detection limit around 20 to 50 parts per billion with this method. However, you can see this is not great and uh, it's not so stable. And we wanted to investigate a little bit the processes in a plasma and uh, what happens there. And so we did all these experiments with all sorts of different metals finding out what is the best, and, uh, and finding some correlations. And here is, a, is basically uh, the intensity, corrected uh, SBR here, and barium was, in fact, the best one. And you have a linear relationship to those elements which have um, a higher dissociation energy with the, with, the fluoride, uh, with the fluorine rather than with the oxygen. 
or the other gives no intensity whatsoever. So that means a barium 2 plus is probably uh, what is uh, necessary to form this interference and this would react then with F minus. F minus in a plasma which is 8,000 Kelvin or 10,000 Kelvin, that's not possible. Plux, plux this in in a SAR equation that shouldn't be there. So let's have a look how we optimize this. And we thought, okay, when we look at these plasma, um, then it should be a cold plasma, very low power, then we get more of this. Yeah, so, and no, we don't. We have here a maximum, but when you crank it up to 1,500, you get more intensity of this BAF plus, which is odd. And what is also, and then we said, okay, maybe we look in the tail, far away, yeah, so which is cooling down and so on, and then it should be formed there, or, uh, uh, or very, very close, or even in the interface. And what we see is actually the highest, the maximum, uh, the highest maximum is very close to the torch here. Uh, we have to go with a sample cone. That may, and what you see also here, barium fluoride is a maximum, is not the same as barium 2 plus. And what we think is happening is basically uh, the PFAS goes in here, you can atomize, you form F uh, atom, and uh, when you have a donut shaped plasma and in the central channel is cold. So if you have a lower temperature like 4,000 Kelvin, then you get also F minus form because, and you have the highest, uh, relatively high electron density still there. And then it combines to F minus in there, but you don't find any barium 2 plus. Uh, barium 2 plus, you need a higher energy and therefore on the fringes between the central channel and the outer uh, uh, donut shaped plasma, there it must be the zone where the BAF is formed. And that's what we think is happening here. And that's why it's so delicate and, and very sharp and not broad, and that's why it's not robust. So uh, it's not great. But that is what it is. And we have a proof for this. For this, when you use then dry plasma and you reduce the central channel, then we don't find any intensity whatsoever. Yeah. Um, we tried to use an ICPMS for something, and then we combined HPLC with ICPMS and then with Orbitrap or with QTOP uh, in this thing uh, after, after, after the column. We spiked uh, water with, uh, with two different PFAS, identified the recoveries, and we were quite happy with this, but, uh, well, but this is one PPB, and this is what you should get. So we are far away from everything, yeah, so. And when you look at the pilot wheels where we wanted to identify the uh, new compounds, whoa, a flatliner, Alles, uh, this, everything is below uh, the detection limits. So what we really need is something which is more uh, sensitive and we really need urgently uh, something, yeah, something, it doesn't have to be an ICPMS, any, something which is sensitive enough for fluorine and which is, uh, also selective enough for, for, uh, for fluorine so that we can specifically determine this in real samples. Well, we, we went then to really dirty places, not to Bielefeld, but uh, to other, thing, other, other places and that's still uh, in, in, um, in, Sc in Scotland and there's a PhD uh, work of uh, Tengentil Ngomalo, if I pronounce this correctly, Ngomalo. Uh, and, uh, and you can see here, this is a total ion count from the electrospray, and then you see here uh, in, in the sewage samples, you see a lot of peaks for barium fluoride in there. And some of them, they don't, do, don't match. And, for, and why do they not match? And here is a standard. Here, this is a fluorotelomer alcohol, totally neutral. You don't see anything in a positive mode or negative mode in the orbit trap, but in the ICPMS you see a wonderful signal. Good example of uh, electrospray is not good enough to get these guys ionized. You have to have to form adducts, and that's what we developed. And in the last thing here, um, so when Gaty wanted to to do this, then she got pregnant. Here you go, that happens, and uh, and then we got a very talented uh, new student from Münster. Uh, Stefan Heukerod, and uh, he uh, did then the study. And that's basically looking at new novel compounds and how ICPMS can help this. So he, he set up 
basically uh, four microcosms. Uh, one microcosm was with sludge and then with mineral as a control and one with the mineral solution and the compound and one was uh, two were uh, duplicates of the uh, degradation. And then we wanted to use an ICPMS and electrospray for this. When you use electrospray, uh, but for this injection here, you get five, in the non-targeted analysis you, uh, using MZ mine, you get 5,000, more than 5,000 peaks, which are potentially new degradation products of this. This is a bit of work uh, to look at them. 4,000 you can, uh, you can d eliminate because of the experimental design. They are in the control. So you are left still with 1,000 peaks, which are potentially compounds. And when you look at the ICPMS results, this is your, the, the, the compound we spiked. And this is a signal. Looks a bit small, but we looked at it. And then uh, with electrospray, um, we looked at the accurate mass and the MSMS fragmentation pattern. And then last month, but not least, we made then uh, um, here uh, the structure determination basically um, of a new novel compound. And that shows basically uh, from using just this retention time, you reduce 1,000 uh, peaks to 21 peaks, and that's you can easily screen. So that's quite useful to use ICPMS. So what we are planning to do in Graz now is to do a whole mass balance. It's not only PFAS, you have uh, also inorganic compounds. You have fluorinate or organic compounds, which can be widespread. Some of them are polar, uh, polar, hydrophilic, non-polar compounds. Some are particulates, as we have heard in the morning. Macroparticles, but also then nanoparticles, maybe PFAS, especially there are so many polymers around. So then we have uh, non-polar um, compounds which you can't detect right now with electrospray mass spectrometry. Then we have the polar ones, they go, and then everybody's analyzing them. But it's only t we only see a part of the whole story, or even traces only of the whole story. And there are the aromatic ones, so the pesticides and the drugs, which are probably also extracted in, in here. And then we have also some hydrophilic ones. And we want to form then an analytical platform which gives them a whole, uh, whole uh, picture of really what kind of uh, fluorine compounds we have there. That's what we want. I want to conclude, PFAS analysis, uh, can atomic uh, spectrometry help? I say yes. Yeah, but, <laughs> it's always a but. But we need a more sensitive fluorine uh, uh, detector uh, for LC and also for GC, whatever. And uh, if there are uh, uh, manufacturers here, please do it. Yeah, so, and uh, I can help. Yeah, I don't want to go into detail, just thanking uh, the group. So, uh, well, this is the pre-COVID uh, uh, Aberdeen group. There are a few people left there. We got new stuff, and uh, you have heard David, fantastic congratulations again. Uh, new stuff in Graz, and we are just, oh, this was on a sample trip, of course. And, uh, and i like to thank all the people who give money for this kind of thing, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for a great talk.